My name is Caroline Robson. I'm a pediatric neuroradiologist from Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm delighted to give this talk today for Health for the World. This talk is about pediatric head and neck infections. I'm going to focus on acute head and neck infections. And my hope is that this will be useful to all images around the world. Many of you may not routinely image acute head and neck infections with CT and MR and may be very heavily reliant on ultrasound. Um, but many of the pearls and pitfalls that I'm going to describe as pertains to CT and MR can be extrapolated to ultrasound as well. And I hope I'm going to show you a variety of both common and unusual cases and that this will be a learning experience for everyone. Um, little background, I was born in South Africa and trained at the University of Cape Town, where that's also where I did my radiology training at the Grudeskio Hospital in Cape Town, and then became a pediatric radiologist at Red Cross Children's Hospital before moving to the United States in 1993. And then I did a couple years of fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital where I have remained ever since. So still have strong roots in South Africa. So without any further ado, let's get started on my talk. So the talk is divided up into three parts. First, we'll look at examples of neck infection. The second part will deal with skull base infection and acute complicated sinusitis before moving on to the third part in which we'll review some cases of acute complicated temporal bone infection. Starting off with neck infection and in fact, this slide highlighting the imaging modalities that we use really pertains to imaging of the neck and the sinuses and the temporal bones. And the technique is going to vary depending on which body part you're imaging. But routinely for CT, we tend to administer contrast, administer half the dose via rapid bolus, wait three minutes, and then acquire images during the administration of the second half of the bolus. And this is known as a split dose technique. And the idea behind this technique is that you really do want to be able to determine the parenchymal enhancement characteristics of the lesion that you're evaluating, whilst at the same time being able to see contrast in the neighborhood vessels. For some cases, you might particularly be needing a CTA or a CT venogram, and in those cases, appropriate adjustments to the protocol should be provided. For head and neck images, we routinely acquire images at three millimeter increments and the same for sinus imaging, reconstructing thinner images as needed and providing images with multiplanar reformats in bone and soft tissue. Now for temporal bone imaging, we routinely acquire images at a submillimeter thickness, either due to the direct acquisition being acquired at submillimeter thickness or images are reconstructed with a high resolution bone algorithm. And then brain images are routinely acquired at five millimeters thickness. <clears throat> images should be acquired using the lowest dose possible in order to reduce the radiation dose to children, but while still providing diagnostic quality images. So not so low that the images become blurred or non-diagnostic. Now for MR, the protocol is gonna depend on the clinical indication. But routinely, when imaging a child with suspected complicated sinus, orbital, or temporal bone infection, we acquire routine images of the brain with diffusion-weighted images, and then fat-suppressed high-resolution T2-weighted images through the region of interest, the inflamed sinus, the inflamed temporal bones. If very high detail imaging is required to show the temporal bone structures, we also then add a 3D T2 weighted sequence and the name of the sequence will depend on the type of MR scanner that you have. For looking at areas around the paranasal sinuses or temporal bones, if you're going to be performing diffusion weighted imaging, we rely on non-EPI techniques so as to limit the amount of artifact due to the air containing sinuses or mastoid air cells. And then of course, MRA, and or MRV are acquired if there are suspected intracranial complications. And gadolinium enhanced images through the area that is infected should be fat suppressed. And if there's any possibility of venous thrombosis, we would tend to also include a gradient echo T1 weighted images so as to highlight enhancing blood within the affected dual venous sinus and to look for areas of occlusive or 
semi-occlusive thrombus. So the first case that we'll look at is a nine-year-old boy presenting with sore throat and fever, now with increased work of breathing. And on this lateral film of the neck, you can appreciate that there's tremendous swelling of the epiglottis and aryepiglottic folds. And this is the highlight, a typical finding of epiglottitis. These children typically have rapid onset of symptoms. Um, they have a change in their voice. They assume a sniffing position. And these are children who should not undergo any further imaging. They are referred emergently to the ENT surgeons for supportive management to prevent airway obstruction. On the other hand, it's important to reflect upon that if you're evaluating epiglottitis in a patient population who have been immunized against the typical organism causing epiglottitis, typically H flu, in that patient population, should you see something that looks like epiglottitis on plain films, there's a good chance that you're dealing with something other than acute epiglottitis. All of these patients, when searching for the word epiglottitis in the radiology reports, were diagnosed by radiologists as having epiglottitis, but in not a single one of them was the diagnosis actually acute epiglottitis. So the first one had a burn, the second patient had mucositis due to rhabdomyosarcoma, the third patient had mumps with lingual tonsillitis, and the fourth patient had a more chronic presentation and was ultimately diagnosed as having granulomatous epiglottitis due to sarcoid. So the pitfall here is to be aware of the history and findings on clinical examination, which may yield a different diagnosis from the one that you'd initially entertained. More commonly, when evaluating kids with suspected neck infection, we get given a requisition from the ED, which says rule out abscess. And sometimes there's an accompanying plain form which shows this appearance where there's diffuse free vertebral or retropharyngeal soft tissue swelling. And the clinical concern is for a retropharyngeal abscess. And these are the typical patients imaged with CT using the split dose technique. This is an example of a patient who was thought by an, a less experienced trainee to have abscesses involving both tonsils. And what you're seeing here is a patient who has severe adenoidal swelling and edema. Notice the low attenuation with streaky enhancement involving the nasopharyngeal adenoid. There's an enlarged retropharyngeal node right here and then appreciate bilateral edema of the very, very swollen palatine tonsils in a patient who also has enhancing enlarged lymph nodes. So this is a typical appearance of phlegmonous adenotonsillitis, and it's usually due to either mono infection or streptococcal infection, and both of these entities look indistinguishable. It's important not to misdiagnose the edema of the tonsils or abscesses, and the way to tell them apart is that when these tonsils are edematous, you still see streaky enhancement traversing the substance of the tonsillar and adenoid tissue, unlike an abscess, which would not have traversing enhancement. This is another case in which, again, similar plain form findings. This child has on the right-hand side a very enlarged and enhancing retropharyngeal lymph node. And remember, regarding retropharyngeal lymph nodes, these structures occur in two chains, from the level of the skull base to the level of the hyoid bone. And the chains of lymph nodes, they're medial lateral chains on each side, so you end up with two sets of lymph nodes on each side, but the lymph nodes are off midline in location. Again, skull base to the level of the hyoid bone. And it is enlargement inflammation and subsequent necrosis of these lymph nodes that leads to the development of a retropharyngeal abscess, often attributable to preceding pharyngitis, adenotonsillitis, or sinus disease. And so initially the node enlarges and enhances, then it becomes hypoattenuating and edematous with peripheral enhancement and ultimately may go on to the development of an abscess. So the first question is, how do we know when a lymph node has actually formed an abscess or whether it's just enlarged due to edema. Certainly this lymph node is very easy to diagnose as enlarged and enhancing. And this is the situation where there is a false negative and a false positive rate for the diagnosis of abscess. And so what you should report is that there is a hypoattenuating retropharyngeal lymph node. It's certainly phlegmonous in appearance and may be beginning to develop an abscess 
but it's really difficult to be certain. Give measurements as well. And in our institution, oftentimes if this is less than two cc's in diameter, this will be regarded as a phlegminous node and the patient will be assessed and admitted and assessed after IV antibiotics for 48 hours. When the lesion becomes more irregular in its margins, we tend to then call this an abscess. But sometimes abscesses lack the irregularity. And so I'd say, well, irregularity is a useful sign. It's not invariably present. And these inflammatory processes tend to be associated with retropharyngeal edema. The edema, unlike the abscesses, which occur between the skull base and the hyoid bone, the edema is midline in location and extends all the way down into the infrahyoid neck and can sometimes even extend into the superior mediastinum. So you do expect to see edema and you shouldn't um, mistake this for an abscess as well. Also be aware of location. So one of the most common locations for head and neck abscesses will be retropharyngeal space, but sometimes we see abscesses arising from inflamed tonsillar crypts. On imaging, these line up and look as if they're arising from within the uh, tonsil itself. But because they arise from tonsillar crypts, the ENT surgeons will allude to these as being peritonsillar abscesses, even though on imaging they look intratonsillar. So again, CT has a false positive and a false negative uh, rate. These we would call large retropharyngeal nodes. This is the one where we might get it wrong and we going to call this an edematous node, possible early abscess, this we'll call an abscess. And in patients in our institution, if they have probable cellulitis, they're managed medically on antibiotics. If they have probable phlegmon, as mentioned, they often get repeat imaging at 48 to 72 hours after antibiotics. About half of these go on to require incision and drainage. And of those, Interestingly, only three quarters will be found to have pus. So again, there's still a false positive and false negative rate. These patients tend to then have a shorter duration of antibiotics, but they have a longer inpatient stay than, for example, those kids who are thought on imaging to have an abscess who are treated promptly with incision and drainage, where there's a higher proportion of those found to have frank pus at the time of surgery. Interestingly, if you're trying to discriminate between these two patient populations using symptoms, symptoms don't discriminate between phlegmon and abscess necessarily, but surgical patients tend to have higher white cell counts and tend to be younger. So, you know, in conclusion of the study performed with a large series of deep neck infections, they're challenging to diagnose and treat. And in spite of this defined clinical practice guideline, about a fifth of patients end up still having no pus at the time of surgery. And here is an example again. Very importantly on CT, so the role of imaging is to, to detect abscess, to accurately diagnose the location of the abscess, and then thirdly, very importantly, to look for complications. And you're going to divide the complications up into three big groups. Those kids who have vascular complications, rarely arterial, but they can occasionally have arterial complications. Um, uncommonly venous, more common than arterial complications, but still uncommon overall. Children who have airway narrowing, mass effect on the airway, this is extraordinarily common. Interestingly in children, um, children may not clinically have signs of overt airway obstruction, although if you were to ask the parent, they may tell you that the child is snoring really loudly at night. That's an important sign of potential airway obstruction. Um, but just to mention that these children, if they are sedated in order to undergo the CT and are not intubated, that they can very rapidly obstruct. So if you should be doing a CT and noticing this degree of mass effect on the airway, be sure to contact the clinician looking after the patient immediately and warn them that there's mass effect on the airway and make sure that the patient's airway is being adequately supported. And then thirdly, any patient with a retropharyngeal infection tends to have spasm of the prevertebral muscles. And this spasm may be associated with torticollis, but the torticollis is reversible. If the abscess is treated and if the child is given adequate analgesia, then the torticollis tends to resolve. So don't be tempted to try and go down a wild goose chase ruling out rotary subluxation. Rotary subluxation is rare, true rotary subluxation, and tends to be a delayed complication, and that then is termed Griesel syndrome.
So just to mention that the third common location to see neck abscesses is going to be arising from an infected jugular digastric node. And in this situation here, there's going to be a differential diagnosis. In this first patient here, for example, is this an abscess forming from a lymph node that has ruptured out? Or could it be an infected lymphatic malformation? If you see fluid, fluid levels, you should be considering the possibility of an infected lymphatic malformation. This is an example of a dermoid, and this is an example of an inflamed second branchial cleft cyst. So in these patients with abscesses around the jugular digastric lymph node, we do recommend obtaining a follow-up ultrasound six weeks after treating the inflammatory process. Also be aware that should you see a patient who has recurrent neck infections, particularly in and around the thyroid gland, usually on the left-hand side of the neck, you should consider the possibility of an underlying developmental anomaly known as a piriform sinus sinus tract. This is a third or fourth branchial pouch anomaly. And on imaging, in addition to the abscess or inflammatory change around the thyroid gland, look upstream in the region of the piriform sinus for effacement, or in this patient, there was actually a tubular tract extending right up to the piriform sinus. These patients are erroneously labeled as having a piriform sinus fistula. This anomaly typically doesn't go from endoderm to ectoderm, so it is more correctly called a piriform sinus sinus tract unless you should de uh, demonstrate uh, external cutaneous connections. If you're going to perform an upper GI study in an effort to delineate the tract, remember that the infection should have been completely treated and died down before you uh, perform this type of exam because if you perform an upper GI exam while the patient is actively infected, the inflammation will uh, result in acquisition of the margins of the tract and so you won't delineate it well on upper GI imaging. And then another thing to mention is that sometimes we see necrotic nodes in the acute setting due to other entities other than just conventional bacterial infections. So this is an example of a patient who has Kawasaki disease. And Kawasaki disease, you can get large and enhancing nodes, you can see necrotic nodes, and you can see retropharyngeal edema. And of course, the telltale rash on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, the skin, um, strawberry tongue and conjunctivitis in these children, of course, are at risk for the development of coronary artery aneurysm. So if you have a child who's had prolonged fever in spite of antibiotics with markedly large nodes, sometimes with nodal edema, remember, especially in young children, to include Kawasaki disease in the differential diagnosis. So I would like to just digress for a moment and just to mention to you that um, children with the acute neck infections um, we mentioned vascular complications, and I should just mention to you arterial complications. Look for abnormalities of course of the vessels. Look for abnormalities in terms of thrombus of the veins, and particularly if the child has a fusobacterium infection, and those are children who are at risk of developing thrombus within the veins, and that is then referred to as Lemire syndrome. Those children have a neck infection, thrombus in the jugular, neck tenderness, and then they're at risk for developing pulmonary emboli. In addition, if you should see atypical manifestations of infection, so midline infections, remember that children love to put foreign bodies in every possible orifice, so in their nose, in their mouths, they can swallow them, they can inhale them, and this is an example of a patient with trisomy 21 who has a foreign body lodged in the nasopharynx over there. Okay, so I'm going to pause now briefly um, to, before starting the next section, part two. Okay, part two, scalp-based infection and acute complicated sinusitis. So in the next part of this talk, I'm going to show you two rather unusual examples of infection, and then we'll move on to sinusitis and its complications. So the first is a child who was thought initially to have edematous retropharyngeal nodes from retropharyngeal infection. But you can see, if you look at the image right up at the top, near the skull base here, you can see that unlike the enlarged retropharyngeal lymph nodes, there's an abscess here that is really in the midline, right up against the basi occiput. And then if you look at the sagittal bone windows reconstructed, you can see that there's a lot of 
erosion of the basal occiput. So this child actually has a skull base osteomyelitis with an abscess adjacent to the osteomyelitis and then edematous lymph nodes. And this is an entity which is recognized by one of my colleagues, Sanjay Prabhu, who wrote this up as a persistent fossa navicularis. So it's a little embryologic developmental anomaly of the basal occiput, which presumably contains a sinus tract or some such abnormality that then predisposes these children, these rare children to skull based osteomyelitis and can also result in intracranial spread of disease. So it's a simulator of neck infection where the primary source is skull based infection. And a similar case also thought initially to have retropharyngeal infection, but now notice that the inflammatory process goes all around the vertebrae. And here the epicenter of the infection is actually osteomyelitis involving the upper cervical spine in a baby who was found to have septicemia and bacteremia due to both viral and bacterial causes and developed a seeding of the osteomyelitis in the spine with this very nasty complication. Now I'm going to show you a very recent case where the child was referred to us as having an emergency large MCA territory stroke and was transferred via med flight to our hospital because of this large infarct and we were told the patient had a positive blood culture and interestingly in addition to this huge infarct you can see debris within the ventricle so the patient clearly had a ventriculitis but what was missed on this initial exam is that the patient had more than just an infarct there's a very large subdural empyema coating the middle um, left sorry right middle cerebral artery and right temporal lobe here. So what this patient turned out to have is again an example of skull based osteomyelitis with spread intracranially resulting in bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis with narrowing of the carotid artery as it travels through the cavernous sinus and exudate surrounding the carotid artery bifurcation MCA and anterior cerebral artery. So this patient ended up with purulence in the subarachnoid space as well as in the subdural space leading to this huge MCA infarct. And the community hospital did not, all they saw was the infarct. They didn't recognize the um, septic situation that had led to this infarct. As you can see, this patient had the subdural empyema, had pus in the subarachnoid space. The patient had orbital complications with thrombosis of the superior ophthalmic vein. Normally, this vein would enhance. You can see the thrombosis here. You can see the edema in the fat in both orbits. So a lot of complications resulting from this very fulminant skull base infection, even surrounding the pituitary gland. And you can see MRA showing you that both internal carotid arteries were involved. The patient had a good circular bullis, and, and there again is the occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and the skull base osteomyelitis. Now let's move on to sinus infections. And the first patient is an example of a potential pit form. So our emergency room can request a CT of the brain without necessarily talking to the radiologist. So as long as their request is for a non-enhanced routine head CT, they simply bypass the radiologist and ask the tech to perform the CT. And so for this patient, they asked for a CT for the evaluation of headaches, sinus tenderness, and fever. And so they got a routine non-enhanced CT. And this was read out by a trainee overnight as negative. Next morning, looking at this exam, it's interestingly that this child has somewhat prominent frontal subarachnoid spaces, and you can see that the brain right here is not up against the inner table of the bone, that there's CSF between the brain and the bone, and that there's abnormal attenuation here, just adjacent to the inner table, separate from the frontal cortex. And so then when we looked, and this was preceding PAC, so this is when we're using hard copy film and we didn't have bone windows, but when we asked the tech to then provide us with bone windows, we were able to see that this child actually had an opacified sinus. So this is an example of incomplete clinical information leading to incomplete or inappropriate protocol. This child really should have had a sinus CT with contrast with imaging of the brain. So the, we recalled this patient, and you can see the opacified sinus. We then underwent an MR, and it became apparent on the MR that the patient had 
sinusitis, that there was edema of the frontal bone with enhancement, so the patient had frontal bone osteomyelitis. There was soft tissue swelling in the subcutaneous tissues, which really should have alerted the clinician to the complicated sinusitis. And you can see that this patient has an epidural abscess intracranially. And then if you look very closely upstream of the epidural abscess, where well, you should be seeing the enhancing superior sagittal sinus, you see what we would call a delta sign, which is a non-enhancing thrombosed superior sagittal sinus. And the sagittal sinus is uplifted against, away from the bone, with the development of pyridine secretion. So that's the epidural abscess, and this is the thrombosed sinus. Interestingly, if you consider the signs and symptoms of frontal sinusitis, pain, fever, sinus tenderness, the symptoms will be indistinguishable from intracranial complications if the brain is not involved, but if there's involvement of the epidural space, you'll still have fever, you'll still have pain, and you'll still have uh, sinus tenderness, so that the clinician may not even appreciate that the child has intracranial complications. Also notice that some of these intracranial complications are quite distant from the initiating sinus infection as seen here. Some of these children go on to develop a subperiosteal abscess known as a POTS puppy tumor. Osteomyelitis is readily diagnosed on MR, but early on in the course of infection, signs of osteomyelitis may be absent on CT, and it may take a while for the typical bone erosion and periosteal reaction to develop such that these features may be only seen when the child is already recovering from the infection and doing well clinically, so it doesn't necessarily infer a worsening clinical course. Notice in this patient also the pronounced steroid enhancement. Now, if you're wondering what clinical signs suggest orbital complications of, of sinusitis as opposed to intracranial complications, proptosis is far and away the most important orbital sign of orbital complications. Should a child then go on to develop ophthalmoplegia, those are the patients where you really worry beyond orbital complications that the patient has gone to develop cavernous sinus thrombosis. But there are a variety of causes of proptosis, including the development of orbital phlegmon, where instead of seeing nice clean looking fat between the lamina papyracea from ethmoid sinusitis, and between the medial rectus muscle, normally you should be seeing hypodense fat. You're seeing abnormal attenuation here. This is orbital phlegmon. If you see reticulation of the intraconal fat, that is known as orbital cellulitis, but it's not always due to cellulitis. You can get reticulation of fat due to thrombotic complications, due to either thrombosis of the superophthalmic vein or thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. So four potential causes of proptosis, and three potential causes of reticulation of the orbital fat. So actually five potential causes of proptosis cause abscess and phlegmon, orbital cellulitis, and then the two thrombotic complications. These are all causes of proptosis accompanying complicated sinusitis. And then here are some examples of superophthalmic vein thrombosis. So that's a normal enhancing superophthalmic vein. In this child with ethmoid sinusitis, notice the tram tract abnormal thrombosed supraophthalmic vein, a normal patent signal void of a normal supraophthalmic vein, high signal intensity on T2 due to thrombus in the vein, and then, as mentioned, the tram tract sign can also be seen on MR. Again, look at the reticulated orbital fat and proptosis. And in this patient, there is, in addition to the supraophthalmic vein thrombosis, you can see that there is also cavernous sinus thrombosis with a fairly abnormal enhancement of the cavernous sinus around the carotid artery and sometimes also look for lateral convexity. So these are all patients who have not only sinusitis, but they have complications of sinusitis either affecting the brain or the orbits. Now what about the brain when it comes to complicated sinusitis, what do we look for? So we've talked about um, soft tissue complications. We've talked about epidural complications. This patient has an example of a subdural empyema. And so what do you look for on MR and on CT? 
If the subdural empyema is hypo attenuating on CT, you can see it, separating the cortex from the inner table and sometimes extending into the interhemispheric fissure. Noticing the bowing of the falx as a sign of local mass effect, you should also look for effacement of sulci around the subdural empyema. The other feature in this patient just to notice is that the degree of bowing of the falx is greater than you'd expect for a small subdural empyema. So if there were just a little subdural empyema, you might expect a little bit of sulcal effacement, but notice how bowed the falx is. So when I see this degree of disproportionate mass effect, it makes me concerned that there's something wrong with the underlying brain. And typically when it gets to the point that you're dealing with a subdural empyema, quite often the underlying brain is abnormal as well. And one of the very early signs you're going to see, in addition to sulcal effacement, very early on on MR, you get accentuated gray-white matter differentiation. And the reason for this is twofold. One is you can get cortical swelling. The cortex becomes thickened and becomes subtly hyperintense on flare and T2-weighted MR. But in addition, you get venous congestion with increased deoxyhemoglobin resulting in very low signal in these subjacent white matter. So the white matter becomes darker than usual and the cortex becomes more swollen and more hyperintense than usual. And once you see this appearance, then something is wrong with the brain parenchyma per se. And that something could be cerebritis, venous congestion, or even incipient venous infarction. As you can see here, there's also decreased diffusivity of the brain parenchyma. So this could be due to cytotoxic edema from cerebritis, cytotoxic edema with venous congestion or overt early venous infarction. And it's really impossible to tell these entities in fact, it, it, apart. These children are also at risk for the development of cortical vein thrombosis, which then can contribute to venous congestion and venous infarction. So these are complicated patients. Now I'm gonna show you another case, which again highlights the pitfalls. So this is another patient who came to the ER and this was a patient who didn't usually suffer from headaches, who was complaining of a sudden onset or recent onset of severe 10 out of 10 headache and neck stiffness. And the emergency room physician asked for a non-enhanced head CT. And the patient had a complicated history in that this patient had a viral upper respiratory tract infection, had a history of recent travel and trauma, was also known to be on as an, an asthmatic on meds for the asthma, including nasal steroids. So we have a whole bunch of things going on in this patient and the patient had this very severe headache. And so the, the ER physician was really struck by how severe this headache was and that the child didn't normally have headaches. And so they jumped to conclusions of the child must have an intracranial bleed. And so the information provided was rule out intracranial bleed. And the radiologist's note was, um, no acute intracranial process, and then they mention in the impression sphenoid sinus air fluid level, which can be seen with acute sinusitis. So there's the air fluid level. And what the radiologist failed to appreciate was that even at this early stage, there's loss of definition of the cortical boundary of the sphenoid sinus. So you should see sharply defined bone here. And I really do recommend that nowadays, in the past, we used to do the brains at five millimeters thickness and bone runners at five millimeters thickness. Nowadays, we routinely provide sub-millimeter bone reformats on all of our brain CTs. Um, because if you look at a five millimeter thick example, you might say, well, this could just be volume averaging. But in fact, this was bone erosion, which was overlooked at the time of imaging. At this stage, we had a banner at the report, and the banner was designated by the radiologist as negative. Negative from the point of view of no intracranial hemorrhage, negative brain. But yet, if you look at the impression, it does mention the sinus air fluid level. Well, the ED physician elected to treat the child with intravenous fluids and analgesia and discharged the child, saying may need antibiotics for sinus air fluid level if symptoms recur. Patient returned three days later, and it was noted by the ED physician that the patient responded terrifically to intravenous um, ibuprofen, so intravenous um, anti-inflammatory agents. And then the patient came back a few days later with headache, chills, photophobia, blurred vision, and double vision. 
and at this point an MR was requested which showed um, a completely filled sphenoid sinus filled with pus, decreased diffusivity, and necrotic material extruding out of the sinus into the medial aspect adjacent to the cavernous sinus here. So this was a by now mucopiocele which had ruptured out toward the cavernous sinus. Look at the small signal void of the carotid artery. So there's spasm of the carotid artery accompanying this complicated sphenoid sinus airflow level. So we do recommend that sphenoid sinus and posterior ethmoid air self air fluid levels should be taken seriously. And the reason for this is as, is as follows. The majority of kids who come with a clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis, majority of them don't develop complications. And in, in most of these kids, the diagnosis of sinusitis is a clinical one. They're seen by the clinician, they have tenderness over the sinuses, they have parallel secretions coming out of their nose, they have a fever and prolonged duration of symptoms. The clinician diagnoses the sinusitis, they don't get complications. The kids who have orbital complications, you look for the proptosis, you make the diagnosis. But the problem sinuses are the posterior ethmoids and the sphenoid sinuses because they are deep-seated. The headache may fail to localize adequately and the patient may not give a history of parallel secretions. And these sinuses also are in proximity to the cavernous sinus. So I would say if you see an air fluid level in the posterior ethmoids or sphenoid sinuses, do be sure that the clinician is aware of this finding for the potential for complications. So here are some other examples of complicated sphenoid sinusitis. So an air fluid level, what does that mean? Does that always mean sinusitis? Not necessarily. It is one of the features of sinusitis, but you can get air fluid levels due to simply rhinitis in patients with allergy, in patients with a cold, or in patients who've been crying copiously, patients who are intubated. But when you see an air fluid level on, the, on MR, you see decreased diffusivity in a sinus, then you may be more concerned for parallel secretions. Again, decreased diffusivity or restricted diffusion, there's a differential. Blood, protein, pus, fungal elements, four things that can give you um, decreased diffusivity and sinus secretions on imaging, on MR. But here's an example of a sinus air fluid level, a bulging cavernous sinus and gas in the cavernous sinus, bulging on T2-weighted images and very heterogeneous signal intensity. This patient has bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis complicating acute sinusitis. Sometimes you'll just see enhancement and bulging of the cavernous sinus and sometimes you'll actually see pus in the cavernous sinus as see here. And when there are cavernous sinus complications, do look at the signal word of the carotid and look for spasm of the carotid arteries, which can accompany both bacterial and fungal sinusitis with complications. But there is a differential diagnosis for complicated sinusitis. So one is if you have a child where multiple extraocular muscles are involved, so in this patient, um, the diagnosis was, right here, yeah, they were thought to have ethmoid sinusitis and were thought to have enlargement of the medial rectus muscle due to phlegmon in this region here. So I will say, once the infection spreads from the sinus to the orbit, typically the rectus muscles adjacent to the inflamed sinus will be enlarged. So if there's phlegmon or abscess, the abscess is usually medial, adjacent to inflamed ethmoids, or it can be inferior in the orbit adjacent to the maxillary antra, or it can be superior adjacent to an infected frontal sinus. And when you have orbital complications, if the abscess is from a frontal sinusitis, look for swelling of the superior rectus muscle and superior oblique. If the abscess is medial from an infected ethmoid air cell, look for swelling of the medial rectus muscle. And if the abscess is inferior from an inflamed maxillary antrum, look for um, swelling of the inferior rectus muscle. What you don't get with orbital complications from sinusitis is swelling of the lateral rectus muscle. So in this patient, incorrectly diagnosed as having a complicated sinusitis, the diagnosis, correct diagnosis is actually orbital pseudotumor, otherwise known as idiopathic inflammatory orbital pseudotumor. So, if you see swelling of lateral rectus muscle, 
away from inflamed sinuses, think again, it's not complicated sinusitis. How about the middle patient? Very complicated patient referred to us for proptosis and sinusitis, thought to have complicated sinusitis. It turns out this patient had sickle cell disease. So we got that history and when we looked at the CT, initially we thought the patient had sinusitis and we thought the patient had phlegmonous change here. But when we looked at the bone images, we saw a very peculiar fuzzy appearance of the lamina papyracea. So at that point we thought, well, in a patient who has sickle cell disease, we know that they are at risk for having bone infarcts as well as osteomyelitis. So we brought in the differential to include those two entities. And in fact, the clinician referred the child to have MR. And when you look at the MR, you see a very extensive well, enhancing appearance of the soft tissues throughout the superior, medial, and inferior extraconal compartments of the orbit and also extending intracranially, so there's epidural enhancement over here. And so we were, at this point, fairly perplexed as to what was going on. And this patient ended up being biopsied and found to have a sinonasal rhabdomyosarcoma. So it was atypical in the imaging appearance on CT and on MR. So remember, sometimes patients can present as if they have infection and turn out to have other entities. And in, certainly in South Africa, um, when I practiced there, we would have included tuberculosis in the differential diagnosis, always with atypical um, appearances for infection. Um, so this patient also was unusual. We were given the history that the patient had infection, facial swelling, and orbital cellulitis. And if you look at the CT, you can see that there is soft tissue swelling extending over the lateral margin of the orbit, over the zygoma, and there is some reticulation of the soft tissues there. So the patient was diagnosed as having soft tissue cellulitis of the face and was read out as having no evidence of sinusitis or of intraorbital complications and looked very carefully for a dantogenic infection, so the teeth looked okay, and was noted that the patient had some aerated secretions within the sinuses. So when you see facial swelling, first of all, you want to see, is there a cause for the swelling in the sinuses, in the uh, teeth, for example, is this dental infection? Could there be salivary gland infection? And then very carefully look at the bones that are deep to the epicenter of the soft tissue swelling. So in this case, all of the swelling is centered around the zyg zygomatic arch. But now if you look very carefully at the zygomatic arch, and this wasn't appreciated at the time of imaging, if you compare the normal appearing left side, look at the definition of cortical bone and the um, medullary space here, and you can see that there's a subtle lucency and perhaps even a sequestrum-like appearance within the bone of the zygoma, and very subtle disruption of the cortex along the dorsal surface. And then if you look at the very thin reconstructed soft tissue images, you can see that there is a little elliptical low attenuation. So it turns out that nobody had told the radiologist that this, this patient had a past medical history of sickle cell disease. So at this point, the pitfall here is really, it is important to ask for past medical history in atypical cases of head and neck infection. Ask if the patient has any infected skin lesions, infected bug bites, whether there's any preceding history of trauma causing this appearance, or in this patient, a preceding medical history. At this point, the differential then becomes, is this osteomyelitis or is this a bone infarct? And radiographically, it's impossible to tell the difference between the two. Um, but in this patient, a needle aspirate was performed, which yielded no organisms. And so although the patient was started on intravenous antibiotics, in the end, this was thought to represent osteomyelitis of the zygoma in a patient with sickle cell disease. And so now I'm going to move on to the final part of this talk, which is part three. And this is going to be a description of pearls and pitfalls of acute complicated temporal bone infection. So again, as with sinusitis, the first case is going to highlight a pitfall. And again, it's very similar to that very first case in the sinusitis series. So this again is a child who came to the ER in the middle of the night complaining of severe headache and the ER requested a non-enhanced head CT, which was performed, and an exhausted trainee, again, preceding PAX days, looked at the hard copy film soft tissue windows and saw all the artifact in the posterior fossa, 
and read this out as negative. The following morning, the attending came in and said, no, wait, this is not negative. There is something in the posterior fossa and then requested bone windows and on the bone images, noticed that the ipsilateral mastoid air cell was opacified and wasn't sure what this mass was within the posterior fossa. So the question was, does this child have temporal bone infection with a cerebellar abscess or is there a posterior fossa tumor in a child who happens to have ipsilateral temporal bone infection? So the patient was recalled for an MR. Now, before we go on to the MR finding in this child, what I'm going to say is as follows. Most children with otitis media and mastoiditis are managed by the clinician without recourse to imaging. So the majority of children with temporal bone infections, the diagnosis is clinical, they may require myrogotomy too, they may require antibiotics, they may require analgesia, most of them don't go on to develop complications. So those patients in whom you suspect complications are going to be persistent, um, long-term symptoms, persistent fever, persistent tenderness over the temporal bone. And if the child has boggy swelling behind the pinna over the mastoid and tenderness over the mastoid, those are the ones where we are concerned that the child has developed what we call coalescent mastoiditis. And these are children then where infection has gone beyond being secretions, effusion, or even pus within the milia space and mastoid, but where the infection is actually spread to the bone itself, that's turned coalescent mastoiditis. So what does that look like? Well, on the index patient, when MR was performed, you can see that there's fluid in the middle and mastoid. Um, you can see that the child actually has a ring-enhancing lesion here, T2, high signal with a capsule, um, ring-enhancing on contrast-enhanced fat suppressed T1, and decreased diffusivity. So now you can say, well, this actually looks like an abscess. And you can see two other things going on here. Um, there is thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus, looking somewhat dark in signal on T2, and adjacent to that, there's a little abscess right up against the back of the temporal bone. So the patient has a perisinus epidural abscess, thrombosis sinus, cerebellar abscess accompanying mastoiditis. In actual fact, the perisinus abscess was missed at the time of the MR. And coexistent pathology was also missed. So look very carefully here at the middle and mastoid, and we're going to come back to this momentarily. <clears throat> so first question is, how do you distinguish between an abscess spreading into the posterior fossa versus a thrombose sinus? So if you look at this patient's CT, this is a contrast enhanced CT. Normally the jugular vein should enhance. So what you're seeing here is the jugular vein non-enhancing. So there's thrombus in the jugular. The question is, what is this in the region of the sigmoid sinus? So normally the enhancing sigmoid should fill up the space here. And what you're seeing is low attenuation. And at first glance, you would just say, oh, that's straightforward. It's a thrombosis sigmoid sinus. But in fact, if you look at the coronal images, you can see that this doesn't quite have the parallel margins of the thrombosis sinus. So this is actually an epidural abscess compressing the sinus. And look at the density, the, de the thrombosis sinus is somewhat more hyper-attenuating than the epidural abscess. T2-weighted images tend to be helpful as well. So generally speaking, an epidural abscess will tend to be bright on T2. Thrombosis sinus typ typically tends to be more heterogeneous and usually more hypo-intense on T2. Gatto-enhanced images won't help you because both the abscess and the thrombosis sinus show low signal and peripheral enhancement. And diffusion weighted images don't help because both the thrombosis sinus and the abscess have decreased diffusivity. MRV, that can be a little bit difficult to interpret because a compressed sinus will have attenuated flow-related enhancement. And a thrombosed sinus will also show as a lack of flow-related enhancement. We do lack the gatto-enhanced gradient echo sequence. Um, so and a patent sinus will enhance, whereas a thrombosed sinus won't enhance, and then of course the abscess also won't enhance. And this patient also, interestingly, you can see protrusion of the optic papilla. There was papilledema accompanying the thrombosed dominant sigmoid and jugular sinus. So children who have complicated temporal bone infection, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, um, they tend to have erosion of bone, Actually, let me skip forward and see if I can find you an example. So 
Um, no, I don't seem to have a good example here. Um, so children with infected sinuses tend to have erosion of bone, and the bone that gets eroded is typically the bone back here along the mastoid cortex behind the ear, and then the bone back here along the sinus plate. And there will be an example later where I'll show you the bone erosion. And infection can spread intracranially either because of directly diseased bone, direct spread, or via emissary veins, the little veins that travel between the mastoid air cells and the posterior fossa. So that, that is how infection spreads. And so in this case here, the radiologist by now, we've gotten used to the fact that we need to look for epidural abscess, we need to look for thrombosis, sinus, um, sinuses and so forth. So this exam was performed, the radiologist diagnosed the opacified mastoid air cells on bone windows, there was erosion of the bone here, they diagnosed that this patient had an epidural abscess compressing the sigmoid sinus. But what was missed at the time of the CT was the fact that the carotid artery, which should be filling the carotid canal in the petrous bone here, is kind of a little narrow looking here. So there's spasm of the petrous carotid artery. And then when you look at the MR, on fat suppressed T2 weighted images, and again, if you don't fat suppress T2 weighted images, you'll miss this finding. There's asymmetric high signal intensity, intensity in this child's petrous apex, and there's asymmetric enhancement in the inflamed petrous apex. So just to digress for a moment, this is a child who's young, and the petrous apices have not pneumatized, so they're filled with marrow. And typically, marrow should suppress on fat-suppressed contrast-enhanced T1-weighted images. It shouldn't enhance. So if you see enhancement of the petrous apex, on fat suppressed contrast enhanced T1s, that is always abnormal. There is some variability into what petrous apices look like on T2 weighted images as they start pneumatizing. And so we have children who have incomplete pneumatization or arrested pneumatization who will have benign corticated lesions in their petrous apices which appear bright on T2. But these children don't have signs and symptoms referable to their petrous apices. They don't have signs and symptoms of temporal bone infection. And so if a child is asymptomatic and happens to have a little bit of bright signal on the petrous apex, as long as the child is asymptomatic, we tend to call those benign petrous apex marrow variants. But if you have a child who's, who's symptomatic of temporal bone infection as, and has asymmetric enhancement, that is not a normal appearance. And then corroborating this abnormal signal look at the affected carotid artery. So when there's petrous apex infections, remember the carotid artery travels right through that infected petrous apex. And so you tend to get spasm of the affected carotid artery with abnormal enhancement and decreased flow-related enhancement on MRA. So this is an example of a child who started off with coalescent mastoiditis, developed epidural abscess, and thrombophlebitis of the compressed sigmoid sinus with thrombosis in the jugular, and um, this patient then also developed petrous apex infection as seen here. Here is another example of a child who had a pneumatized petrous apex, but this patient had um, developmental issues and the patient was autistic. And so this was a misdiagnosis. So the child ended up with a very chronic petrous apex infection. So see there's tremendous bone erosion and there's erosion of the sphenoid bones. So, extensive that we initially thought this child had a, an aggressive tumor because we saw such extensive bone erosion. But notice that the bone, the very dense bone around the inner ear structures is intact. So usually when we see petrous apex infections, um, we don't typically see erosion of the dense bone around the inner ear. Um, but neglected infections can spread to neighboring bones. The key is that the infection looked bright on T2 and did have decreased diffusivity. And then this is the patient after antibiotic treatment where the bone reconstituted itself. There is a differential diagnosis. If you see aggressive bony destruction, you're going to think of um, other infections, including tuberculosis. You might think of tumors such as lung or heart cell, histiocytosis, or metastatic disease. So the key is to ask the history. The clinician was absolutely emphatic that this child had signs and symptoms of infection. And um, the clinician turned out to be correct. Um, this and was another patient also with autistic traits. 
who also had a very prolonged history of ear pain, headache, and recent development of sixth nerve palsy. And the imaging showed a very aggressive infection of the petrous apex and enhancement extending into the internal auditory meatus and CP angle cistern. We again thought this was going to be a tumor in this region here because of this component looking so uh, hypo intense on T2 rated images and so avidly enhancing. By the time the patient came to imaging, the, the inflammatory process had spread to the cavernous sinus. And so um, this patient was all set to go to the OR for biopsy, but the patient's mother um, then gave the history that the patient had had a single shot of cephalosporin and had shown a dramatic symptomatic improvement. So we were quite shocked by this history and lo and behold, um, this patient turned out to have a very chronic and neglected infection that simulated tumor in this region. And the key was the dramatic improvement in response to antibiotics. And so this was presumed to be granulation tissue. And this child did indeed um, improve dramatically in response to intravenous antibiotics and did not in, in the end require biopsy. So a very unusual infection. Um, and so here is the follow-up in that patient showing significant improvement after antibiotics. Um, and this is a patient who was known to have a cochlear implant, so a foreign body device. Again, a pit for a prolonged clinical course, multiple causes of antibiotics, but the patient ended up being diagnosed as having fungal infection that eroded as a result of the cochlear implant, eroded the petrous apex, as you can see here. And the pitfall in this patient is that the patient um, initially did not undergo MR because of the cochlear implant device. The patient had CT and there was a lot of beam hardening artifact and this little low attenuation focus, as well as the mild asymmetry of the fourth ventricle was overlooked. So that by the time a decision was made to remove the device and have the patient on MR, well, it turned out this patient actually had a little cerebellar abscess that was um, missed initially on the non-enhanced CT. So this is the contrast enhanced CT showing the fungal abscess in the posterior fossa in a child with an implanted foreign body and fungal disease of the petrous apex. So now just back to that index case. So let's go to, this is the very first patient who came and had a non-enhanced CT. The radiology trainee missed the cerebellar abscess, but we got the child back within a few hours, did the MR, diagnosed the abscess. The ENT surgeon said, We'd like to get a CT because we want to know how bad the coalescent mastoiditis is. So I promised you we would show an example of bone erosion. So what is the hallmark of coalescent mastoiditis? It is bone erosion. So very hard to diagnose destruction of mastoid septations and very hard to know if that is something that has happened acutely or chronically. Um, you can't look at symmetry because mastoid air cell development and bone formation is quite often quite asymmetric. But it's never normal to see erosion of the bone between the mastoid air cells and the sigmoid sinus. Once you see that, you should diagnose coalescent mastoiditis. It's not normal to see erosion of the bone laterally. When that occurs, you can get an abscess developing laterally, which can track into the neck, and then it's called a basalt abscess. And you can get erosion of the tegmen tympani or roof of the mastoid and middle space. Tegmen tympani, tegmen mastoidium giving you intracranial spread. This patient has an intact tegmen and has eroded a sinus plate over here. But what should we have detected on MR? When there's fluid in the middle of your space, you should be able to see the ossicles as seen here, and you don't. Um, so even on MR, you can say that the ossicles look deficient. And on CT, when you have acute infection, typically you don't get ossicular erosion. So what this patient actually had initiating the infection was an obstructing cholesteatoma, so an acquired cholesteatoma resulting in eroded ossicles, blunting of the scutum, and this cholesteatoma blocked the um, drainage of the mastoid air cells, so this child then, as a consequence of the obstructing cholesteatoma, developed coalescent mastoiditis with the intracranial complications. So a pitfall of imaging was missing the coexistent pathology on MR, but it was certainly detected on CT. And here is the white ret retrotympanic mass that you might see on direct clinical exam and decreased diffusivity on MR. And this is another case, again, showing you that in the attic, you should see the ice cream cone shape of the ossicles on fairly thin T2 rated images, and you don't see it over here. So this is another patient who had cholesteatoma 
complicating and obstructing, um, sorry, Restodad is complicating unobstructed cholesteatoma. Here is another case where the clinician came to us and said, I'm worried about this child. So we had diagnosed complicated coalescent mastoiditis. We had diagnosed the bony erosion on CT. And so by virtue of opacified air cells in conjunction with bone erosion, we then deemed this to be coalescent mastoiditis. We had said that there was thrombus involving the sigmoid sinus. And the clinician's concern was that the patient had developed a terrible persistent CSF leak. They were pouring CSF um, out of the nose um, and, and swallowing salty fluid. So clinically, they said the patient had a CSF leak. And so they came to the reading room and said, I think this patient has a tumor. And so I looked at these images and said, well, there's a lot of granulation tissue. There's a lot of enhancing tissue and there's bone erosion. Why would you suspect a tumor? And the clinician said, well, when patients have infection, typically you get granulation tissue, so they don't develop a CSF leak. So the bone erodes, they get granulation tissue, the CSF leak seals. But I think there's a tumor in there because it's very unusual to develop this degree of a CSF leak. And I said, well, um, maybe this is granulation tissue, it could be a tumor. And then they said to me, well, actually, to tell the truth, we can actually see a tumor protruding out of the middle ear space and the external canal, and we've actually biopsied it. So in fact, what this patient had, so I had thought that this bone erosion here was due to a cholesteatoma. So we had said, based on the CT, that there was coalescent mastoiditis and the cholesteatoma causing bone erosion. Normally, cholesteatomas erode the ossicles laterally. So I said to him, well, maybe there's an uh, uh, past tensor cholesteatoma or congenital cholesteatoma, but in actual fact, what this patient had was a malignant tumor in the middle of their space eroding the ossicles. So the lesson here was always learn from your clinicians. Um, they do know best and be aware that if they tell you that they are concerned, you should listen to them and be concerned as well and, and help them find what they think they are seeing. And then this last patient sent by the ER as a case of coalescent mastoiditis, and the patient had facial nerve palsy. The radiologist thought the patient had Petrus apex infection, but the patient had widening of the facial nerve canal and erosion of the internal auditory meatus. And on MR, a large mass, kind of reminiscent of that earlier patient, only this patient had, the mass was going into the facial nerve canal and into the medial space. This patient ultimately ended up having biopsy of this mass and was found to have metastatic neuroblastoma, and he has the primary tumor with MIG, MIBG positivity um, of the mass at the Petrus apex. So in conclusion, in this talk, which was really to highlight the pearls and mostly the pitfalls of imaging of the head and neck, I hope I've highlighted to you how very important it is to discuss all your cases with the clinicians, get additional clinical information before you provide a report, no anatomy, no pathophysiology, anticipate findings and know what to look for. And then if you see atypical features, you do have to be able to figure out how to account for them. And I found it very useful that if I have a case and something's not quite right, I ask my colleagues for second and third opinions. And very important to follow up your cases and to ask the clinician what was found at surgery so that you can then learn from your clinical colleagues. And very importantly, learn from your own mistakes and share your mistakes with your clinical colleagues and with other radiologists so that everybody can learn from the mistakes that you make. Uh, I think a fair dose of humility is always helpful for all radiologists because um, we are inclined to make mistakes no matter how diligent we are. Uh, we always do mistake, make mistakes in this profession, so share your mistakes and learn from them. Thank you. And that is the end of this talk.